Okay, why don't we get started? Uh, this is Mesos and the architecture of the new data center. Um, I'm going to make sure that I preface this by saying this is uh, definitely planned for beginners. So anyone looking for me to deep dive into Mesos internals, I'm going to be disappointing. I apologize in advance. Um, but why don't, uh, why don't we jump in and get a little started? So uh, who am I? I'm Thomas. Uh, I'm a product manager at Mesosphere. And uh, I'm a bit of a bear. Uh, there, was, there were some bets going on. I'm a little bit known for not wearing any shoes. So uh, for everybody who wanted to know, yes, no shoes on the platform. That's the way I roll. Um, I've been doing distributed systems for a long time. <clears throat> you all notice my beautiful neck beard. Um, I've not actually been a product manager most of my life. I'm an engineer. They just told me I had to do product because my code wasn't good enough. Um, with <laughs> no, no, it wasn't a nice way. It was a very much, no, we just won't take your code at all. Deal with it, Thomas. Um, anyways, I work for Mesosphere, uh, data center operating system, Mesos, all kinds of cool things. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be, for this talk, uh, not going into actually the architecture of a new data center. Um, as someone who's done ops, I can go and rant externally or eternally about all of the things related to architecture. But um, I think that there, there's going to be at least five or ten other talks here while we do it. So instead, what I'd like to do, oh, my slides are mixed up. What I'd like to do is talk about why we need a new architecture from the developer's perspective and what it does for the developer and how far can we take it. Um, so going back a slide here, I've got a bit.ly link. I created a DCOS cluster. Uh, anybody who wants to go play around with it, please do. Put that in. That's the cluster I'll be using, so try not to kill it for me or else I'll be very sad. But otherwise, kick the tires while we're doing the talk. I'll probably leave it up for a while later. Um, but you know, you're welcome to give it a try while we, while we go along. So uh, we talked a little bit about the agenda already. <sighs> who uses a data center? And I think this is the most important thing for, thing for us to think about because there are a ton of people who use data centers, but there's two that I think are really important, uh, particularly for this talk. And uh, being a product manager, I care a lot about personas. So at Mesosphere, we have a couple personas that are near and dear to my heart. The first one is Dan, the data center operator. Dan wants to, make, wants to have his data center happy. He wants to make sure that he's got enough capacity to run everything that's going on. And Dan really hates getting woken up at 3 a.m. Uh, who's been on a production service, been woken up at 2 a.m. and just grumbled and hated it, right? Like, I can't tell you the number of times that I, as a operations person, got woke up because of some, I'm not going to say asshole developer, but since I wrote, wrote the code, I'm going to say asshole developer. And uh, it then took two hours to debug, and then you have to wake the developer up. It, it's really painful. Um, so. What we like to do, and this is why I think the, this new architecture is really important, is Dan isn't in charge of the applications anymore. He doesn't have to take care of or worry about the health of the application. He worries about the top-level services. He worries about the marathon. Is it running? He worries about Jenkins. Is it running? He doesn't actually worry about the apps that run on those. And this is a really important point because it's changing the responsibilities of your traditional data center, the number of startups that I've worked at where you pitch code over the wall to a Dan who puts it together, eventually makes it into some scripts and runs it, and as a developer, you have no idea what's going on is, I mean, it, it's always something that happens. And so uh, there, the last point there is he doesn't actually want to know what individual workloads are. Dan really doesn't care about your Java app. He just wants to make sure that it's up and running and the CEO isn't bugging him about having major downtime. So then we move on to Alice, and Alice is our app developer. Alice wants to create new apps in a rapid cycle. In fact, Alice wants to be self-serve. There's no reason why Alice wants to go and wait for months, weeks, for a deploy to happen because, you know, at some point, if you throw your code over the wall for someone to do a deploy, you sit there and wait, and when it goes into production, you've forgotten what code you wrote, and now you have to debug this app that you wrote a month ago. It's painful. I, I really hate it. Um, and so that is, that is basically Alice in a nutshell. So what is broken in our data centers? Let's start off by talking about how you deploy to one server. 
Um, again, I'd love to see a, raise, uh, a um, hands raised. How many people have ran production apps in screen on their cluster? Yes, it's not just me. <laughs> you don't need to use an init, no, no. You just put it into screen and you walk away. Uh, in fact, I'm going to say that if you're running it on one server, that's the right way to do it. It's easy. You just go start the app. You don't need to think about it anymore. USCP, the bit's over. And if you're missing a dependency, it's one box. All you need to do is install it by hand. So this is our mainframe world. This is back the way it was. This is, you know, it was great. But at some point, our apps needed to fit on two servers. And when we hit two servers, screen started to not work real well. SSH server one, SSH server two, SSH, oh geez, I don't want to type SSH anymore. Um, and then you've got cluster SSH, and you've got, I mean, the, the number of tools there to just SSH into n number of servers is, is intimidating. But apps don't fit on two servers anymore either. How do you get to 10 servers? Well, when we needed to go to 10 servers, we created Chef, Puppet, Salt, Ansible, CF Engine. Pick your code deployment tool of choice. And to be honest, it's pretty good. When you've got 10 servers, it, it works. It takes you a while. You write some code to deploy your code, because, dude, I heard you like code to deploy code to run your code so that you could code all the time. Um, but it, is, but it is a little bit fragile. Uh, in fact, um, one, of the, one of the first products that we did at Mesosphere had, was basically a implementation of uh, Puppet to deploy Mesos clusters into the cloud. And we saw, on average, 25% failure rates of creating clusters. And the reason for that was you have a random Ubuntu mirror in Amazon that just doesn't want to work. What do you do? Uh, another big one that we had was DigitalOcean just happened to not have instances sitting around for a couple minutes. What do you do? It really ends up being fragile. And when it's fragile and you do a deploy, it comes up on 75% of your boxes, and you hope that it's right, and then the 25% don't health check, and then you have to sit there and debug them. And again, at, at 10 servers, you know, it's not that big of a deal. You go and you kick a couple servers, or again, some... Uh, we're going to call him operations guy, this guy, goes into the server and fixes something or does performance on one box, didn't tell anybody, and now you've got this cluster of snowflakes, of, of pets that you've got named. So we've got uh, Fido in the left and uh, Billy right there, and, and you know, you, you, get to be, you get to be personal with them. Once you get to 100 servers, this really starts to fall down. You end up with constant 2 a.m. debugging sessions. Um, I was actually chatting with uh, an application developer friend of mine about working at um, <clears throat> eBay. And he said that the eBay deploy windows, you had a 2 a.m. session, the code would go out, and you would just sit there and debug and debug and debug and be on a conference bridge. And it was one of the most painful things that he had experienced in his life. And if we think about it, deploying your code is the thing that matters. Because deploying your code gets it to the customer. And so if you are scared of deploying code, it slows the business down, it makes your developers unhappy, it makes your ops guys unhappy. It's, again, it's, it's painful, it hurts. So let's talk about deploying to 10,000 servers. If you've got 25% failure rates, you need an army of DANs. Because 25% on 10,000 servers, that requires days of debugging to get your application up. And it's basically never ending. You end up putting out fire after fire after fire after fire to the point where you can't actually do anything with your infrastructure. You're just trying to keep it running. And you know, once you're behind the eight ball, it's almost impossible to get caught up again. So obviously, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We happen to be here at MesosCon. Isn't it great? So here we go. This is uh, on the left is a Sunfire E25K. Um, I decided to do a little bit of Googling. Um, this mainframe came out in 2008. Uh, does anybody want to guess how much you can buy one for now? Uh, eBay has a current auction for $8,000. But I think the most important thing to look at here is, uh, how are these two different? You've got 144 cores and a terabyte of memory, and you have 144 cores and a terabyte of memory. And, and I understand that this is high level and it's, it's a bit abstracted, but, but when you think about it, 
its resources and its scheduling, and that's what Mesos does great. <clears throat> so this is an awesome quote from Ben. 64 cores or 128 cores in a single computer looks a lot like 64 or 128 hosts. Why are they different? Why have we created this block in our brains that says that this is something different? Well, Mesos says it doesn't have to be. As soon as you start thinking about it as one big computer, there's all of these amazing things that start to happen because you manage your resources globally now. So instead of having statically partitioned a Hadoop cluster and a Spark cluster and a Java cluster, you manage your resources globally. In, in fact, res, uh, capacity planning is one of the hardest things that you do traditionally as an operations team because you need to go and look at what everything is doing and, and how they're related and make sure that you order servers just in time for any of these apps that might be running on your data center. But with this, you just put an alert that says, okay, we've got 25% capacity left, guys. It's time to go order a rack. You can actually just send an email to your Dell rep and say, okay, another rack, please. I've got less capacity. Or, I mean, you can even go more advanced in the cloud. You can just go launch more servers in the cloud. It makes auto-scaling become this thing that is not really an issue anymore. So we're talking about deploys. We're talking about app developers. And I'd like to, to bring everybody back to screen. I know that I said screen was a little ridiculous, but it's so easy. You just SSH into the box, you start up your screen session, and you have a deploy. And the most important thing, again, is getting code out to customers, because that's what makes people happy. So why, don't, why can't we do one computer deploys? Well, we can. Let the tools take care of it. All you need to do is define the resources that you require, state where to get your code, and stand back. Um, you'll notice that this is uh, a sleep container. Um, I'm going to say that uh, the killer app for the data center is distributed sleep. You heard it here first. <clears throat> At least I know how to ride, run distributed sleep really well. Um, so let me, let me go and do a bit of a demo here. Um, I'm going to show off DCOS, but pretty much everything that I'm showing off is mesospecific. I'm just really lazy and know how to use DCOS. Um, so first, let's focus a little bit on that, that uh, one big computer. We've got 24 CPUs and 82 gigs of memory. I don't have anything failing. And I've got a service that's running. So pretty much within 30 seconds, I know the health of my data center. I know what's going on. It's a big computer. I've got six nodes. I've got resources. Why do I care about anything else? And then we can go over here and look at Marathon. And luckily, no one has started some horrible app that would embarrass me. Um, but let's go actually, uh, actually start an app here in my fancy terminal. If I go take a look at uh, my container JSON, just a simple sleep container again, basically what I showed off. Go Docker. Uh, the Thomas R sleep container is, is very special. It is a three megabyte container that only contains the sleep binary. Um, but its deploys become just as easy as screen here. DCOS Marathon app uh, start. Woo! Nobody saw that. Well, of course. There we go. And just to show that the proof is in the pudding. Sure enough, distributed sleep is happening in front of us in real time. Here we are, started up, and you know, it's easy to scale. It's simple. We can just hit 20 here. Not only that, but um, it's, it's easy to update it. If I, I went back to my uh, JSON here and put in a new tag for this Docker container, all I'd have to do is update it, and Marathon and my one big computer would take care of deploying that and running it on my entire data center. So let's get back to the slides here. Sure enough, I've got a bunch of instances running. So I've shown deploys. It's easy. That's fantastic. Uh, Kubernetes does this. Uh, Yarn does this. Um, Mesos obviously does it better. That's why we're here. But uh, Let's, let's not stop there. Let's, let's go to the next level. We, we've shown off how application developers can, can self-service themselves for applications. 
but the applications today, it's more than just sleep. Uh, distributed sleep is a very unique application that only works for me, come to find out. Some people actually want to have business value in what they run. And, and so applications are not single applications anymore. We started out with a LAMP stack, and we had Apache uh, and um, MySQL, and you know, life was good. But now we have Cassandra, we have Kafka, we have Kubernetes, we have uh, Spark. Our applications of today to deliver the really big business value are made up of hundreds of these things, and they're coming out every day. And I, I just had to throw in Web 3.0. I think we're on Web 5.0 now. I'm not sure. Um, but how do you deploy a new service? So we talked about an application, but that's pretty simple. It's pretty easy to figure out how to get a sleep container onto a box. But how do you get a Cassandra ring running in a data center? Well, <laughs> you go purchase new servers. And you know, in the cloud, you have to go purchase new servers. They just happen to come in 30 seconds instead of two weeks. And then you, know, you have to rack and install it. You have to write the deployment scripts. You have to hook up the monitoring and the alerts. And at some point, this is an amount of work for your poor Dan in your data center of weeks, maybe even months, because he needs to figure out this Cassandra ring and how to work and how to make it you know, run in production. And so the bastard operator from hell comes out. And when you come and ask for a new service, Dan goes, there's no way, no way I'm going to let you run that service. I'm, it, it's just, it's not going to work out. And uh, that sucks. As an application developer, you want to go run the new hotness. You understand that it's going to make things faster. And it's awful to hit this hard wall that says, no, I'm sorry, you can't do it. Well, Mesos can help. Why? Because it's a two-level scheduler. And two-level schedulers are magic. Because we've abstracted the resources from a cluster, we can have something that orchestrates our very specific application. And so one of the great examples of this is the HDFS framework that's out there right now. HDFS needs to come up in a really specific way. You can't just go and create HDFS containers and tell something to go launch it across your cluster. You need to go bring up the name nodes. Then you need to bring up the data nodes. Then you need to make sure that anything you're running is on the data nodes so that you have locality so that it works. And that's where the two-level scheduler comes in. It makes it so that that complexity is taken care of. Um, there's a talk later today by Joe Stein about the Kafka framework. The Kafka framework is Joe Stein saying, this is how you run Kafka in production. And, and as an, an ex-operations person, that makes me really happy and comfortable. It means that I don't have to think about deploying this. I don't have to get new servers. I don't have to monitor it. I have somebody who's an expert that said, this is the code, this is the automation. Why don't we run it? So let's create a package manager. Uh, this happens to be a unique feature to DCOS, but the package manager is actually nothing more than a marathon JSON that you can configure. Uh, very, very complicated. Um, so basically, this just launches the scheduler and lets the scheduler take over the rest. And in fact, there's a bunch of packages. So if we go back to my command line here, and I do a DCOS package search, we get to see that there's actually quite a few fun packages here. In fact, there's two in here that are particularly interesting, Kubernetes and Swarm. In the past, when you wanted to go play around with a new tool, again, you had to wait as an application developer. Wait, wait, wait. But now, you can go to Dan, and Dan types DCOS, package install, Kubernetes. Yes, I'm, I'm really sure that I'd like to do that. Thank you. And uh, now I have Kubernetes. I can go use Kubernetes. H has anybody here actually tried to set up Kubernetes on their own? How many hours did it take you to get it running? Days, right? Well, oh, you're better than me. It took me a week. It was embarrassing. <laughs> uh, but we have it up and running here, you know, in seconds. And, and there's more. There's all kinds of things here, just like the packages you would expect on your operating system. They come up. They're running. And if we go take a look at uh, DCOS, you'll notice that we're consuming resources. We have memory allocation consumed. We've got tasks running. It, it's you know, coming up. It's doing what it's supposed to. In fact, why don't I just go show off the marathon UI? 
Here we have Kubernetes. It's getting launched. And Docker containers are, you know, big. It'll take a little while, but it'll come up. So that's, that's package management. And because of that, Dan says yes. Dan doesn't need to take care of it anymore. He just makes sure that it's running. He gets out of your way. So where do I start? Well, I've got that cluster up and running. I, I honestly would encourage everybody to go check it out if you're interested. It's pretty fun to kick the tires. Um, if you'd like to create your own cluster, DCOS is a click away at mesosphere.com slash Amazon. Uh, that's the current cloud provider. We also have some Azure targets that are available. You can uh, launch an application. We've got a tutorial for um, our Twitter clone, aka Oinker, so that you can all oink at each other. And, it is, and it's not just a trivial web app. It, it actually brings up Cassandra. It brings up a Rails front end. It gives you a load balancer and routing. It gives you Spark. It, it's a, a real legitimate application. And um, as someone who's done a little user testing on this, it'll take you about 30 minutes, which is just awesome. It, it gets me really excited. And then finally, uh, we've got a tutorial on installing services like I did. Uh, the command line is just that easy. All you need to do is install services. Um, and with that, uh, I'd strongly recommend everybody go put Mesos in production. Um, obviously, DCOS is awesome, but I'd strongly encourage you to uh, do at least Mesos. You're all going to be happy about it. Um, and with that, uh, questions? Anyone? Anything at all? Have I made some wonderful? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, let me, uh, let me actually show it. Let me show you how it works. Uh, uh, so the question was, um, how does the package manager work? How do you get it into DCOS? Why, it, how is that out of the box? Um, so if we go to, uh, I didn't even spell that right. I need to just auto-complete things. No, that's not even it. OK, that's it. I'm going to type this in really quick here. Ah, stuff and things. There we go. So uh, this is the universe. Uh, this is the source of all packages in DCOS. And uh, it is as simple as, let's go look at one of the packages. Uh, why don't we show off the Marathon package here? It's versioned just like you would expect a package manager. And then there's this Marathon JSON. And so this Marathon JSON is the Marathon JSON that you would use to launch it. So in fact, if you didn't want to use DCOS at all, and I'm probably horrible for saying this, uh, you could just get this Marathon JSON and run it on Marathon, and you would be happy. The only thing we're doing here is making it so that it's configurable. You can set the CPUs, you can say whether you want to use HTTPS or not, and you can tell it where everything is. There's a lot of wonderful configurable features in Marathon. Um, but that's pretty much it. The universe, like, uh, the CLI just pulls this down as a JSON blob and runs it. We like to keep things simple, make them work. Uh, any other questions? Go, yes. What's the role of Kubernetes? How does Kubernetes and Mesos work together? So the question was, um, what is Kubernetes? Why does it on Mesos? How do they work together? And uh, so let's, let's get back to that two-level scheduler again. Um, Mesos only cares about resources. It says, I've got resources here. Why don't you use them? That's all it does. Kubernetes does everything. So putting them together, Mesos tells Kubernetes, here's all of the hosts you can launch things on. And Kubernetes goes and launches them. And so it's actually a pretty simple integration because Mesos just makes the resources available. And then Kubernetes can consume them. Um, Kubernetes is a fun one. The one that I really like is um, Myriad, which is running Yarn on top of Mesos. 
which kind of breaks your brain, but it's really the same thing because Yarn is that monolithic scheduler instead of a two-level scheduler. You can put it on top because Mesos makes it aware of the resources that are available, and then Yarn decides to use them for your Hadoop, for your Hive, for whatever you want in that Hadoop ecosystem. So, so the, the question was, what happens when resources become unavailable? And that is entirely up to the scheduler. So with Marathon, if a task dies, it goes and waits for the next resource offer and launches it again. For uh, Project Myriad, it's pretty much the same thing. Myriad goes and grabs some more resources and goes and schedules the jobs that died over there. But the, the, the cool bit here is that you are not stuck in this world of chef and puppet. It's dynamic. Because the framework understands the topology and the resources of the cluster, it can react to them. Whereas your chef and puppet, chef doesn't know when a node went down. It just knows when you run it again. And because of that, it can't react to the um, failures. So one of the cool things about the Cassandra framework is that when a data node goes down, it brings up a new one and it rebalances the data. Again, Dan doesn't want to get woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning. Computers take care of that for you. It's, the, it's that like codification of the operations process that gets handled. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Can I contrast it? Yep. Uh, the, in fact, at some point, Kubernetes is a uh, competitor to Marathon. Um, I, I will, again, not say the party line here. Uh, Kubernetes has got some really great opinions. Pods and labels, for example, are really fantastic. A lot of the things they're doing with the durable pods are really great. And so it becomes a, uh, a pick and choose. Because you can run as many frameworks as you want on Mesos, you don't need to have this cluster that just launches apps. You can have a cluster that launches apps, and runs Cassandra, and runs Spark, and runs Kubernetes, and does whatever cool new thing you want. In fact, um, one of the things that, as a product manager, I'm most excited about is this ability for partners who want to run things on-prem, not needing to sort out what it takes to run on-prem. You can put a package together and DCOS package install it and deliver it to your customers in a fast, easy way for a distributed system that nobody can do today. Again, like doing a trial of your software for Cassandra, for example, is a significant advance and a significant investment for the organization. It takes a week of somebody's time, two people's time to get it up. But if you can just type DCOS package install Cassandra, you can go kick the tires, you can go check it out, you can see whether it's something that you want. And so no longer is it reading a bunch of white papers to say, okay, I think that this is the right thing to do you just go run it, try it, see if it works with your app. Uh, something I get, again, super excited about. Um, OK, any other? How, how are the frameworks managed by Marathon? So a <laughs> Marathon is a meta scheduler, and that breaks most everyone's brains. Uh, I've got a designer at Mesosphere I'm still trying to get this concept across to. But what you need to do is you need to remember that you can disconnect a process that's running as a scheduler. So let's pick on Kubernetes, for example, because I showed that off. Kubernetes has a scheduler that runs, and it has tasks that it runs. And the scheduler needs to run somewhere. So if we take Marathon out of the picture, how would you run the Kubernetes scheduler? You would go write a system D unit, you would go run it on one of your hosts, and it, the system D unit would make sure that that box got restarted, it would make sure that everything worked, and then, and then the tasks would get launched by Kubernetes. So by going and putting it into Marathon, all we've done is move it from a single box system D to a cluster-wide system D.
I'm not sure I understand. Right. And so the so what happens is the scheduler launches those. Right. And so the thing that, that Marathon manages is only the scheduler. So the scheduler process comes up, it registers with Mesos, and then it goes and creates the master and all of the other nodes that it needs to actually run Kubernetes. And then those are managed and owned by the Kubernetes scheduler itself. So, so again, Marathon is doing nothing more than in it for your data center computer. I mean, it, again, it's, it's the same way. The, with DCOS, all we've done is claim that, that Marathon is an init for your data center and just launch your schedulers on it. And again, it's, it's a bit meta, but that's the way it works. Mm hmm Sure. Sure. Uh, you, you go and shut the tasks down. Um, so, so entirely seriously, uh, so the question was, um, you're out of resources, what do you do? Or maybe even a better one is, how do you make sure that each framework gets the resources that they should. And so in Mesos, there is the, it, the scheduler itself inside of Mesos does something called um, dominant resource fairness. And what that basically says is, is that each framework has its own max share. In fact, uh, I might be able to show this off here. If we go to the Mesos UI itself, And we go over here to frameworks. Watch this just not work anymore. Um, it does. So you'll see the, the max share here. So Mesos is tracking the amount of resources that have been consumed on this cluster. And so you'll see that my Kubernetes here is consuming six CPUs and 26 gigs of memory. And Marathon is only consuming three CPUs and two gigs of memory. And so because Marathon has a smaller max share, it will get the resource offers first. And so Marathon will get the first chance at that. Now, that isn't a guarantee, obviously, and that's where um, one of those new features that Ben talked about earlier in the keynote comes in. Um, that's where quota comes in. So with quota, you can say, no, no, really, Kubernetes, you get 100 gigs of memory. That's all you get. Take care of it. Great. Uh, yes. Uh, DRF is always going, and it, it is just, again, all DRF does is reorder how the resource offers are offered to a framework. That's all it does. And um, you can actually configure DRF with different weights, and so you can say, I know Kubernetes has 48% of the cluster. Wow, that's really going. Um, anyways, I know that it has 48% of the cluster, but it can... Um, it can have that, and so I still want to give it resource offers, um, but it's not sufficient, again, for guarantees. That's where quota really comes in. Okay, uh, what, time for one more question. So the decisions for, for whether to run a process or kill a process 
are dedicated entirely to the framework itself. And so what that means is for Marathon, it will never kill a task, it will never release those resources unless it's told to. Now, um, Kronos, in comparison, is a cron distributed cron for your data center. And so it has a lot of logic in there to actually kill tasks that run too long. But that, again, Mesos itself only cares about resources. It says, hey, I've got some resources here. Would you like to take advantage of it? And then it waits to say whether you want to consume those resources or not. And that's because of that, that abstraction, we can do a lot of cool composition, which is why Mesos is something that you can put Kubernetes on top of. You can run the, the batch workloads because your batch workload scheduler will run it and knows how you want to run it, and your long-lived application scheduler knows how to run that as well. Okay, uh, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Have a great rest of the day.